Well, welcome uh, to the 25th edition of the Miami Jewish Film Festival in 2022. Uh, it's, as, you, as many of you know, the biggest Jewish film festival in the world. Uh, and uh, this year we have about almost 150 films. Uh, thanks to all members and sponsors, uh, I think this festival is going to be one of the, one of the best ever. Uh, from the German consulate. I am the German consul in Miami, Andrea Siegel. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to continue this long-standing partnership with the Miami Jewish Film Festival. And we're very honored and have the great pleasure uh, that I have the opportunity to talk to uh, director Vadim uh, Perelman, uh, who directs the film uh, Persian Les Lessons, which will actually be the closing feature of the, of the festival and we'll have sort of a particular uh, exposure. Um, uh, the, the film, um, I think we're, we're going to talk about a few details on that, but it will be a screen on the 27th of January. That is uh, not uh, sort of a, not, not an accident. It is Holocaust Remembrance Day also. And the Holocaust and the Nazi period is of course one of the uh, to main topics of the film. Now, I've, uh, I understand, um, you know, Vadim, your approach to this film was to be a little bit different than the other films about that period and Holocaust uh, that, that, you've, that we've all seen. Uh, so can, can you tell us a little bit about your approach, what you wanted to do differently? Well, I think the, the main, thank you, by the way, uh, thank you to the festival for this great honor and uh, closing the festival, the biggest Jewish film festival on Holocaust Remembrance Day, I think is, is, a, is an incredible honor. I'm very, very thankful and, and pleased with that. Um, but yes, my approach um, was different. And I think the main difference was uh, Holocaust films, uh, it's almost a genre of its own now. <laughs> Uh, and what 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 happens is there's a there's a range, and the range probably goes from like Son of Saul uh, realism, almost hyper realism, painted bird, you know things like that, to a more uh, well, probably farcical is not is not the right word to but to to a more to a lighter approach, you know as. Uh, Jojo Rabbit, Life is Beautiful, where you just, you know, where you, um, I want it to be somewhere in the middle. You know, that's one thing that I wanted to do. But that's not what's different. What's different really is um, the way I portrayed the Nazis, the way my story portrayed the Nazis is, is I mean, all the films that we've seen, not necessarily even Holocaust films, but all the films we've seen with Nazis in them, uh, they've always been portrayed as very flat, evil, uh, robotic, uh, almost like killing machines that basically just bark out orders, rouse, schnell, or kill mindlessly and, and cruelly and, and just do that. Now, we forget that they were people, you know, and, and I think that's one of the dehumanizations that happens, you know, in war. Now, this is in no way, uh, you know, uh, forgive them or or to 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 uh, in any way condone what, what they were doing, whatsoever. But um, but they were people, you know. And I always thought, isn't that even more terrible to to see a person on the screen to have a character that loves that is jealous that has fears, that has a past and a future hope, you know, things like that. And that is more, it just becomes more horrific to see them doing what they do, <laughs> you know? I think, uh, today, um, especially for the young generation, I mean, there are still a few Holocaust survivors who share their experience. And that's of course the most uh, emotional uh, and, and drastic um, a way to understand what happened at that time. Uh, the other thing is to commemorate uh, well with um, sort of the sites of the previous cans and so on. Uh, and the other ways are just with films and, and 
this this way to do it. I think you you've chosen to to have a sort of a background which combines several real sites in history. I think you uh, it was inspired by by Natzweiler Struthoff in Alsace, yes, but uh, exactly. also, but also uh, in um, in the sort of the entrance yeah. the speech the, the, the Buchenwald the Buchenwald. Okay. Uh, so and I think you well, and, and the film was actually uh, uh, was actually produced in um, in Belarus, if I understand correctly, um, and uh, uh, mainly in Minsk, uh, or also in a, a little in a town to called Bobrusk, uh, I think. Bobrusk, yes. Bobrusk was the most of the shooting was done in Bobrusk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which and actually, as I, as I read uh, at the at the time, there was also. Uh, uh, a Nazi internment uh, camp at that place at the time. So. Many, there were many, uh, many very, very uh, evil and strange uh, connotations to that place. It had a history. It was, a, I think, it was a Nazi uh, internment. It was a KGB prison or NKVD. Again, some sort of a, I don't know, army uh, barracks. And, and it, it, it was just a place that had all kinds of creepy, you know, yeah. feeling when you were in it. Yeah. No, but, but uh, coming back to this contrast and tension, which is created by uh, the fact that Holocaust is the most um, sort of dehumanized environment that you can imagine. Uh, but there are living characters and these are human beings, uh, in particular, the two main character, uh, Gilles, the Belgian son of a rabbi, and this uh, uh, officer in charge of the kitchen of the camp, who ironically is called Koch, uh, which in German yes. is uh, the chef. Um, and <laughs> yeah. so, and they uh, meet in rather, well, bizarre circumstances that the the Belgian Jew declares he is Persian, uh, not to be executed with other Jews uh, who are transported to the camp. And that sort of saves his life uh, because um, this uh, officer in the kitchen wants to learn Persian because he has the idea of going to Tehran and open a restaurant there. And yep. uh, well, that leads to, to the fact that the uh, uh, that this uh, Belgian Jew has to invent a new language. Uh, which uh, sort of is a symbol symbolism very, very strong, saying that only this means of an artificial language is a means of communication between these two worlds, the world of a persecuted Jew and of the officer in the, in the camp. And also, also a changing catalyst to, to their personalities in a, in a way, mostly to the Koch's personality, you know, where he he can communicate in that language much more honestly and much more humanly than he can in German. You know, he can say things that he wouldn't be able to in German. Well, he, uh, he, I think he undergoes also a certain uh, development. Um, I mean, in the beginning, it's, it, it's very clear that, uh, that it's a hierarchical uh, relationship between the two, uh, but then, he understands more and more that he also he needs uh, Gilles. He needs the or Reza, as you call symbiotic. It. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, and and then in the end he is he uh, astonishes uh, sort of his teacher uh, by uh, reciting a poem that he he has written out of this artificial language. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've studied uh, linguistics also, so I, it's fascinating for me to, this concept. Um, but but um, I understand actually this is based on a novel by by a German uh, script writer Wolfgang uh, Kohlhase. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk about that in a second. But I just want to get back to the language. What what I think is it's it is interesting because it is the main mode of communication that we have as humans, you know, and and uh, it's it's a bridge. You know, we're in a strange way it's a bridge because it's neither. French, which is Gilles, uh, you know, native language, nor German, which is Koch's native language, and and uh, which in, in which they have a certain um, um, identity already kind of built into the to the to their language. This language allows them not to have that identity anymore. And what's interesting is that every time I'm in um, 
you know, I make movies, I always have to have a window into the, it always has to have something to do with me, uh, the stories. And I was wondering, what does this have to do with me, really? How does it apply to my personal life? And what it was, I was an immigrant at 14 years old from the former Soviet Union, from Ukraine. And I went to Canada to, then with my mother. And I didn't know a word of English when I arrived. So I had to invent my own identity through English language, you know, which, which was in, it kind of in, in the same way. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, it was a short story, not a novel, written by Wolfgang Kohlhausen, uh, who uh, wrote this in 1952 in the former East Germany. <coughs> he was an East German and, and um, he wrote a short story called Invention of a, of a Language. And it had a lot of similarities. Uh, a prisoner was uh, a student prisoner, a former student was uh, teaching Farsi, invented Farsi, to a couple, not to a, not to a Nazi, but to a couple who was also Jewish, I guess, in a way, uh, they all were, and uh, therefore surviving. It was very much, and that's it. And, uh, and the plot was, it didn't have the great hook that we did, and that we invented, which is the language in order to remember these words, because that was the hardest thing. Inventing them was easy, as he says, it's the remembering. In order to remember, he decided to have mnemonics, essentially, of people's names, you know, around them. <laughs> so, and that's that way he also ended up remembering the names. But mostly he remembered the language was ironically, I guess, in a way, and, and kind of upliftingly, was made up of people who died. You know, it was a, and, and uh, of Holocaust victims, Jews. He was teaching a language to a Nazi <laughs> that was made up of Jewish names. <laughs> that's what, that's what's uh, it's another ironic thing about it. I, th I think that's, that's really the uh, sort of the main uh, symbolism of the, of, of the story that um, this is a, uh, uh, I mean, as we said, this is a dehumanized, depersonalized environment, and the Nazis did everything in a very uh, systematic way uh, to um, sort of to persecute and to annihilate uh, a group of, of people. Uh, and by uh, and to destroy all traces of it later too. By by, by being very bureaucratic. Uh, I mean, Germans are said to be still rather bureaucratic, but uh, uh, to by putting down every entrance and every everyone who left uh, the camp, uh, that was also, of course, afterwards uh, ways to, to to persecute those who uh, who were in the camps, except uh, for the cases where all these documents were uh, were burned. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in this case, uh, the memory consists in the mind of Jill. Uh, who uh, <clears throat> actually has this as a uh, sort of uh, as a bridge uh, to to his hope to escape this situation, and by by memorizing this uh, these names and these uh, well, the interesting that I mean not interesting, but I think the profound thing, and I I do believe it's profound, is that you know if this was a story of just a one man survival. Still would be interesting to watch for two hours, I guess, and and to see how cool oh, isn't he clever, isn't he inventive, you know, Yiddishkopf type of thing, uh, and but to give him a reason for that survival, that is really even unknown to him. I mean, that is why I guess we can talk about it as we discussed in the final scene. He starts crying while reciting the names is because he realizes the magnitude of what, what he had just done, that he'd literally uh, put up a memorial to those people that would have been gone, that would have been burned twice, once in the actual uh, camps in, the, in Auschwitz and the other time in the, in the oven, their names in the book, you know, and they would have no trace of these people, maybe memory, but no, no trace. And names are very important to, to Holocaust 
<laughs> uh, right. backwards, you know. And uh, well, during the film, I mean, he uh, has a lot of uh, very difficult moments. He's always on a razor's edge uh, to be uh, sort of discovered as as being a liar, and uh, uh, several incidents uh, where it's very cri critical for him. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, um, he is uh, on the, ma the, the main, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's profiting or taking advantage also of a privileged relationship to, to the cook uh, with some better food than the others have, etc. He feels the guilt. He feels the survivor guilt of all that. Of and uh, when, but when talking about it, uh, he feels indeed very guilty when uh, when the officer tells him that he gained weight uh, during the time in concentration camp, which certainly is not the case for the prisoners. Um, so, uh, but it's it's that that contrast with the human dimension and the the intrigues and the sort of the secondary uh, personalities that are evolving in the background uh, that that uh, makes this uh, key a uh, mainstream uh, plot even more interesting. Yeah, that's, you know, that's part of the humanization of, of these people that I wanted to get across, that they have their own, I mean, as banal as office politics, you know, that's what, that's what they essentially have showed. Because I always, I always imagine, I always have this image, maybe one day I will show it even in some, because I'm not finished making Holocaust movies, I think the more, the more the better. Um, I want to show, uh, you know, in Auschwitz, there were homes where officers lived. Uh, there were barracks for the soldiers, but there were, for the officers, for, you know, there were homes for, for administration of the camp and who Mengele lived in a, in a little house uh, on the outskirts. And quite often they would bring, because they lived there for years, they would bring their families from Berlin to live there. And I guess they were far enough, so the smell and all that didn't bother them. Uh, but there was I'm just I'm just imagining uh, some Hauptsturmführer uh, waking up one morning and putting on that black uniform, and his wife coming up to him and brushing dust off his shoulder and saying, "Will you be home for dinner?" And he says, "Well, we have a train coming in at 4 p.m. I might be late." It's okay, well, have a good day, honey. <laughs> Imagine that moment to her. And that's 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 what that's what I was trying to say earlier. It's humans that did that. Yeah. It, it makes not, not even necessarily Germans, you know. Yeah. It, it could have been completely flipped around. That makes it, it, it makes it even more frightening for, for those of us uh, well, who were sort of uh, who are young, even the young generation who cannot imagine how this how yeah. this was, but Actually, uh, as many other events in the world uh, tell us, uh, I don't want to go into politics right now, but uh, it's, it's, it could be anywhere. It could, could anywhere. happen again anywhere, and that's why I believe that that Holocaust movies should be made and made over. Well, another Holocaust movie. I like people saying that. Yes, another Holocaust movie. See it again, yeah. and learn and learn and remember. That's the important thing to remember. Yeah. Well, I, I was uh, in a previous sort of function at our ministry in, in Berlin. I was responsible for commemoration uh, policy, and we also edited a, a few books on that topic. And yeah. uh, uh, well, one of the things is that, that commemoration is being done differently in different countries. Uh, even, even now in, in Europe, it's, it's done differently. I think uh, in Germany, uh, now, I mean, this was different in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, but now I think uh, Germany uh, has gone through several stages of commemoration and is confronting this with quite uh, a lot of openness, which, which others are still not, uh, not doing to that extent. Now, in that, in that context, I, I, I admire that, that uh, you have done co-production with, with different, in different countries um, uh, and uh, so you brought, in, in particular, I, I can see a technical crew also was whether uh, whether Belarusian or, or Russian or it was uh, uh, it was a crazy Babel's tower on on this shoot because there were about ten languages spoken, mm -hmm. and the actors spoke one language. I don't know a word of German. <laughs> I had to direct a film in German. 
you know, the script, the original script was written in Russian. I took the Russian script, translated it myself to English. Then it was every day translated for the actors in Berlin and sent over by uh, sent over to the actors at night so they could learn the lines from the next day you know so yeah it was it was quite a co-production and then it was we I, I i i'm understanding where you're heading with with this is that then it premiered at berlin film festival yes it to a great ovation from the germans which yes. was yeah which was quite interesting and they they germans germany is still some of the biggest fans of this movie they really are Chinese too for some reason but German you know it's it's a it's a big big uh, it was a big success kind of interrupted by COVID but it was a big success in Germany. Are you aware uh, um, if it has been screened in Belarus as well? No uh, Belarus no in Russia of course yeah mm -hmm. I mean I just came it was just at the Jewish Film Festival in Moscow mm -hmm. and, and Moscow Film Festival actually yeah. premiered there. Uh, the regular one, and uh, no, I mean it. It it's not Belarus. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no I, I can't because we, we we were up for the Oscar yes. from Belarus, and yeah. then we we got disqualified because there wasn't enough Belarus in our Belarus co-production. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what it was. Well, yeah. well that uh, <clears throat> of course um, is is a. Also fascinating to to understand this the making of the film, this international uh, context. I mean, you have Lars Eidinger, one of the uh, most famous uh, German actors, uh, but in particular, you have the actor playing uh, Gilles, who is Argentinian origin, and then I think who also didn't know a word of German, and he, he spoke did. German the whole film, <laughs> and 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 he spoke <coughs> with a French accent, or more more or less, but very very slight one. Uh, which is very credible in that uh, in that context. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was afraid that, and he says, "Don't worry." He told me, "Don't worry, I'll get it. I'm good with languages." Mm -hmm. Yeah, his native language is Spanish. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's uh, uh, all these uh, tensions and contrasts make it really a film where uh, you can't stop. Um, um, sort of watching and and being curious of how it will develop uh, further, yeah. uh, and uh, the uh, uh, I mean this contrast again between uh, the uh, dehumanized environment in the camp uh, and the impression that the officer Koch wants to give that th that they or at least the two of them have a normal relationship. Um, it's uh, a key moment in the film is when when he responds, "Well, uh, you are cooking the food for the murderers," uh, and uh, and that makes it clear that it's not a normal relationship at all. No, and I, I don't think Gilles ever felt that way. No, I don't think Gilles changes. I mean, the only thing we modulated was the amount of fear that he had in every scene. But I don't. He has. A, he doesn't change. Uh, really and also i don't think you know one interesting thing that i thought about later i don't think he's a rabbi's son <laughs> i really have that I, th I think he's just like a little petty thief or something like that from brussels mm. just a little vagabond like charlie chaplin kind of character mm. who you know who who who's used to lying and immediately i mean how quickly do you have to how quick do you have to be in use to lying to be able to come up with the idea then and then to come up with the idea you know it's it's uh, it's an interesting thing and 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 his redemption you know at the end actually helps that yeah, yeah. no it's it's really a, a fascinating film uh, to watch and uh, i can encourage all those uh, in uh, watchers of the, of the film festival to not certainly miss this opportunity uh, to watch the person lessons, personal lessons. Uh, and I think uh, unless you wanted to, to tell us um, sort of one more key thing that you wanted us to, uh, to remember, um, I would like to thank uh, Director Vadim Perelman uh, for this uh, interesting discussion and uh, wish all the, all those who are members and sponsors of the festival and those who watch Still a pleasure with, with all the films to watch this year 
and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.